of the morning, thank you for the light. Lord of the church, thank you for this holy community. Lord of the cosmos, thank you for the glory of music. Now, Lord of our hearts, we invite you to fill us, to shape our minds and our very beings into conformity with your character, so that in the week to come, we may cooperate with you in bringing help, hope, healing, and beauty. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. The Apostle Paul closed his most joyful letter with an interesting phrase, giving and receiving. As a final statement of the many joys he had already shared with his Philippians brothers and sisters, he rejoices in how so many times he's been able to rely on them in the exchange of giving and receiving. I personally have received so much joy from this Philippian church of ours. I receive joy when I walk into the kindergarten classroom every Sabbath and see smiling faces running in the door. I receive joy when I read about the full freezer full of soup down in our kitchen that just has a warm bowl of soup ready for anybody who may be in need. And when I think about it, I also receive joy when I look at the clean carpets and freshly painted walls and clean pews every week that create such a warm, pleasant environment for us all to gather. How have you received joy from this local church of ours? And how might you like to give back in return? Will the deacons please stand as we pray? Father God, we are so thankful for the gift of giving and receiving. And today, Lord, we give back to you in the ways that we can. And we thank you for the, the way that you will bless it. Amen.
actually about the place where the offering that you collect after you go back to your seats is from. A few years ago, well, how many of you know where that is? Does anybody know where it goes? A few years ago, I went to this place. About five or six. And it's a place called Thailand. And the offering that goes, that we collect after the children's story, goes to help an orphanage in Thailand. I didn't go to this orphanage, but I went to a place that was a school for kids who sometimes, some of them didn't have parents, so it was kind of like an orphanage. Um, and the school, um, when I get, went there, I had to fly a long way, and then I got off the airplane, got in a car, we drove for a long way. Has anybody ever driven in a pickup truck? Nobody. A couple of people have driven in a pickup truck. Well, in this pickup truck, there were not enough seats. So some people had to get in the back of the pickup truck, and then we had to drive on a dirt road. The dirt was really, really red and muddy, and if you got out, you would get dirt all over the place. The pickup truck was really dirty, actually. And we finally drove all the way to a village where um, there was a school, and we were trying to help the school. And the place where I work has done this for several years. In fact, we built a dormitory at the school so the kids who live far away would be able to come to school um, and learn things. And we built, let's see what else. Well, this trip, they didn't have clean water, so we helped put in uh, a filter so that their water would be clean uh, and purified, so there was a water purification system. Um, and we do projects like this a lot of the time. And when you give your money uh, after the church, sometimes it, after the children's story, sometimes it goes to those things. And we've gone back to this place. I haven't gone back, but other people uh, where I work have gone back to this place. And it turns out there are other things that they needed. Um, the school actually had a church across the creek from the school. And when they wanted to go to church, they would dress up just like we do, but they'd have to get across the creek. And they'd either have to walk out on the street. Remember what color the dirt was? Anybody remember? Red, right? They'd have to walk out on the red street, go all the way through the muddy street, and then come back around the creek, which was sometimes muddy too. Uh, and their clothes would get dirty. So they wanted a bridge. So we helped them build a bridge. So we built things. But it turns out that on that trip, and a trip after that, they had a bridge, they had a school, they had a dormitory. Oh, we built bathrooms too. But we built a lot of things like that. Uh, there was something else that they got. Actually, somebody, a group like ours, had gotten some money together and had bought them a piano. How many of you know how to play the piano? Anybody? A couple people know how to play the piano. Um, how many of you know how to play the clarinet? One person back there. So I um, want a volunteer. Actually, I'm not going to ask for just anybody. I have Ava. She already agreed to volunteer. Now, I'll tell you, she doesn't know how to play the clarinet, but we're going to see what she can do. Um, can you play that hymn right there? Really loud so everybody can hear. No? <laughs> oh, you can just put it in and then really blow. We'll see what happens. No? Maybe Johnny, you've done this before. We can let him. Oh, there we go. Does it sound like the hymn? <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> it doesn't sound like the hymn, does it? Um, now, the thing is, when these people got their piano, nobody knew how to play the piano. So they wanted to play it for church, but nobody knew how. So do you know what we did? So our school sent over a piano player the next year. And we sent them for two months so that we could teach the people there to play the piano. And it turns out that they wanted the same things for their church that we have for ours. So they were not so different from us. In fact, um, we're really fortunate here to be able to have music. Um, I can try to play a little bit of this hymn here. Uh, I'll put the microphone down and play the same part. I might mess up. <laughs> Right? So I've had lessons, and I've learned how to play the clarinet. And the people who had the school and the church, and all of these other things, they also had a doctor. They had lots of things in their community that people had contributed to. But what they really wanted was music during their church. And I can tell you, I've been to other places. Everywhere I go to church, people want to have music. And we're really fortunate that we can do that. And it's something that we can do when we go somewhere else, uh, is to help people with whatever we know how to do. You can go back to your seats.
we bow our heads in worship together this morning, thankful for your presence and for the presence of one another. We find delight in the light streaming through the stained glass windows, the sound of the orchestra and the choir, and the budding flowers on the trees signaling a change in season soon. God, we come this morning with both our joys and our sorrows. We are so excited to welcome another smiling face to the GLC congregation. And we ask that you be with baby Eden and Brian and Katrina and little Ethan this week as they adjust to their new family of four. Lord, we also ask for your peace and healing hand to be with those who are sick. We especially think this morning of Diane, Werner, and Sheila's mother. God, as they battle severe illnesses, we pray for your healing hand and comfort. May there not be a moment that goes by that they don't know that you are with them. And Lord, long ago, we asked that you show us how to pray. And you did. So now, together, we give you our hearts to go through the best of all prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
As Adventists, we take the word of God seriously. And in times past, we have been known as people of the book, which means that we take everything in the book. But some of the things in the book cause us to pause and to think. And uh, there is tension that sometimes needs to be resolved and sometimes can't be resolved. Uh, Listen carefully to our scripture reading. Suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his mother or father, even though they discipline him. In such a case, the father and the mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. The parents must say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and refuses to obey. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town must stone him to death. In this way, you will purge the evil from among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid.
One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples broke off heads of grain, rubbed off the husks in their hands, and ate the grain. But some Pharisees said, why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus replied, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests can eat. He also gave some to his companions. And Jesus added, the son of man is Lord even over the Sabbath. I was in kindergarten, no, not kindergarten, excuse me. Michelle talks about kindergarten with such glowing terms, I put it in my head. It was primary I was in. I was in primary this morning, and I was watching, it's mostly young men, one young lady who was behaving herself, and the rest were young men. <laughs> and as I watched them doing gymnastics, more or less in place, and watch their teacher attempting to actually move forward in the direction she was trying to take the class, my mind went back a few decades. I'm going, yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that would have been me. Poor teachers. It was especially poignant this morning because this week I was back visiting my dad. He's 96 years old, not doing real well. I go back to see him occasionally. So I'm back there and he's lost most of his hearing. We can't really have good conversation. You know, if I speak clearly, slowly, emphatically, you know, we can get a few words back and forth, but conversation is not really possible. So we just sit together. You know, I wheel them. It's back east. It was freezing cold. Six degrees. Snow on the ground. It was beautiful as long as you were inside. So we would go and sit by a window and look out at the world, watch the birds, admire the blue sky. He might doze a bit. But he was for a man who's completely undemonstrable, uh, uh, undemonstrative, he was demonstrably happy. I was looking at him going, you know, you really are glad I'm here, aren't you? I mean, I didn't say that out loud, but I'm, you know, in my head, I'm going, man, I didn't realize it mattered that much. I have five siblings. I think I'm probably the one that he is the easiest with. But it was a long time coming. <laughs> because I was his problem child, at least one of them. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> because I think he was a little bit more ordered than I am capable of being. But as we're sitting there and we enjoy our time together, and I imagine that he remembers other times when you know, he and I are the only two who enjoy heat like real true Southerners. We would sit on the back porch in the evening when it was 90 degrees and 90% humidity and the two of us would just be sitting there going, you know, we're special. We're having fun sitting here cooking. <laughs> only he and I and the entire family share this. But occasionally, when he would talk, I would need to edit what he said. He no longer has, 
you know, he, his mind has declined some, but the primary loss is a lack of, is a loss of um, restraint. So whatever he thinks, he says. And sometimes it's entirely inappropriate. He talked about staff in the place. Completely inappropriate. Talked about family members. Completely inappropriate. And I just look at him, shake my head. No. The way that I love my dad at this stage in his life is I ignore some of what he says. And I'm going to argue that the way we love God is we must ignore some of what he has said if we take the Bible as every word from God. Now, this is a radical statement. I'm hoping you will listen. I'm hoping you will argue with me in my head. If I don't persuade you, I hope you will let me know. Did you hear the first scripture reading? And then the choir music? Did you get whiplash? Here's what God says. If you have a son who is unruly, forgive me for editing, it says rebellious. How do you distinguish the two? You know, if you are made to move 25 hours a day and then they put you in a classroom, it looks like rebellion. I'm going, mm, I don't know. Who could sit still for as long as you're supposed to sit? So you have this kid that cannot sit still and so you take him to the elders and you go, I don't know what to do with this kid. They stone him dead. That's what the scripture said. And then... Some medieval monk wrote these glorious words, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. And the music was this ethereal floating sound. How do you put those together? Which comes closer to the heart of our religion? The words of Numbers 31 Stone your kids that you can't control. Or the words of a medieval monk who said, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. I don't have any question. If I didn't put those labels on it, if I just said, is killing kids or making peace more like God, we'd all go, making peace. And then I go, oh, but the killing kids part came from numbers. And the making peace part came from a Catholic, which in an odd, <laughs> in an Adventist audience can be controversial. We're dealing with weighty issues. So, with that as a preamble, let's look at our scripture passage for the day. Jesus and his disciples are walking along a path through a grain field. The disciples are hungry. Are you hungry, Andrew? Yeah, I can get hungry right now. So, you know, there's stuff to eat. You know, there's crackers in here. He pulls them out and starts munching. They, they pick this grain, they rub it in their hands, blow the husk off, and they, they munch on it. There are some religious conservatives along, and they look at what these guys are doing, and they go, what? You know that our religion says you can't do that. Now, let's be clear. When the Pharisees challenged the disciples, they had solid Bible foundation for their criticism of the disciples. The rules about Sabbath keeping were not pulled out of thin air. Rabbis had taken the scripture, 
the words of scripture, they had wrestled with those words, asked, how do we apply those? How do we make them real in life? And they had come up with the application of those words. But let's be clear, they started with the words. And if you think they were overstating the case, you know, look at what the scripture actually says. You know the Sabbath commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Don't work on the Sabbath day. Don't have your kids work. Don't have your donkeys work. Don't have your servants work. In Exodus 34, 21, we have these words. Six days you are to work, but on the seventh you must rest. Even during plowing season and even during harvest. Now, if you're in agriculture, you know, there's times when you work 25 hours a day, you got to get stuff in the ground. You've got a window. You've got to get it in the ground. Or when it comes harvest time, you've got to get the stuff out of the field. It'll spoil. Rain's coming. We have a little hay field, you know, and you're here in Washington trying to find a dry seven days at the height of hay season. It's crazy. Even during harvest, you must rest. Exodus 23, 12. Six days do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on that day shall be put to death. That's pretty scary. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. I'm, I'm reading this. Look, let's make clear that when the Pharisees came up with some pretty strict rules for Sabbath keeping, they were not just inventing. They were taking the words of Scripture and seeking to be faithful in mapping out a, a pattern of life for the people of God. And if we are scornful of them, we don't understand what they were doing. They were, they were attempting to be faithful and wise in the application of Scripture to life. And we've spent 2,000 years criticizing them as Christians. If you go back and look at what they were doing, they were much wiser than we give them credit for. So, the Pharisee, and not the Pharisees, this is rabbis going back way before Jesus. They had taken that passage that specifically said, you must rest even during plowing and harvest. And in their list of prohibited activities, they had kind of spelled it out. So on Sabbath, you cannot harvest. You can't reap your fields. You cannot thresh your grain. You cannot winnow your grain. Now, some of you, most of you know what winnowing is. Threshing means smashing it to knock the husk off, and winnowing it is you throw it up in the air and hope the wind blows away the stuff you're not going to eat. Here the disciples were picking grain, that's reaping, rubbing it in their hands, that's threshing, that was winnowing. Now, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are going, oh, come on. That's not, that's, that's not really harvesting. They were just doing a little bit. I mean, harvesting is if you do a whole bunch. And, and that, that makes sense. I mean, you, you and I, we're, we're kind of common sense people, and we're going, look, the difference between picking a little bit and, and doing a whole day's work, I, I can see that, and, uh, but it's a slippery slope. Now, I kept wrestling, how are we going to make sense of this in our culture? We don't, we are so far away from there. Well, 
a week ago Friday, I went to a, uh, a graveside service, I'm not sure what, a military funeral for David Grauman. And I think I've been to military funerals before, but not one for an officer. Uh, David Grauman had been a colonel in the reserve. And so, you know, this, this, this service had a little bit more than what I remember being, seeing before. The feel of the service was not heavy and somber. The, the person who did most of the speaking, you know, he, he talked with Joyce, the widow, and he even joked with her a little bit. The, the, the feeling of the service was we're honoring somebody who lived long and lived well. So, so there was not this... <clears throat> but then they had an... A, I think you call it a color guard people who manage the flag. Whoa. This looked like robots. They moved with such precision. I can't move with that kind of precision. Um, they moved with incredible precision and every fold of the flag, it was, it was like a machine. I mean... I was amazed that they did this. And then when it came time for the, for the, the gun salute, the way they, you know, it wasn't like, you know, hey, grab your rifle, bam, bam, bam. No. Every movement of the team was perfectly choreographed. They moved absolutely together following a very precise pattern. And as I watched this, well, as I was thinking back on it for this sermon, I'm going, you know, if one of those guys or gal had screwed up, my guess is that after the service, they wouldn't have gone, oh, well, nobody's perfect. They would have been chewed out royally. In the military... Now, if, I need to speak gently. I have not been in the military. I haven't even been close to being in the military. But my understanding is that in the military, protocol is absolutely inflexible. You know what you're supposed to do, and you better do it. I think if we were going to understand the Pharisees' interaction with the Sabbath... Maybe it would help for us to think of that model of the military respect for protocol. It's fixed. It's not flexible. It's not approximate. It's exact. And it's their way of showing respect. So for the Pharisees, they said, look, Sabbath, it's really the banner of, of our national identity, our religious identity. It's our flag. The slightest disrespect for this flag is, in fact, disrespect for our identity as a people and disrespect for God himself. When you attach that kind of weight to the rules about Sabbath keeping, you better get them right. If threshing is wrong... Don't even get close to it. Because you're rubbing grain in your hands today just for a bite. Three weeks from now, you're going to be doing it in a bowl at home, fixing dinner. Three years from now, you'll be doing it out in the field. So we just cut it off right there at the top. How did Jesus respond? This is, it blows my mind. I've wrestled with this for years. The Pharisees challenged the disciples. Hey, you guys, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're breaking the Sabbath. And I don't know, but I imagine that if Jesus had allowed the disciples to respond, they would have said something like what you and I would probably say. They're going, look, it's not such a big deal. Come on, don't, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. You know, that... They would have minimized what they did. 
But Jesus did not minimize what they did. In a sense, he upped it. He said, hey, haven't you guys ever heard about David? How he ate the holy bread? David was the most famous warrior in Israel. He had been brought into the royal court. But the king had become insanely jealous of David because the people clearly admired David more than they did the king, and the king was nuts. A couple of times in a fit of rage, the king had tried to kill David, but finally it was not a fits of rage. The king had decided, we got to kill David. David runs for his life. He goes to the town where the Jewish tabernacle, their worship center was. And he doesn't have any food. He's hungry. So he goes into the priest and says, man, you got any food around here? And the priest says, I'm sorry, I do not have any bread that I can give you because the only bread I have here is holy bread. But here, and the priest gives David the holy bread and David eats it and David shares it with his men. Jesus said, if David could take holy bread, David, who was a mere layman, the law was explicit. That bread was only to be eaten by priests. David was not a priest, not even close. And David's men were even (laughs) worse. If David could do that with holy bread, my disciples can do this on the holy day. Jesus stiff arms them. He doesn't bend an inch. He does not minimize. Jesus stiff arms them. It seems to me that the way, you know, and I wrestle, what's Jesus trying to say here? What is the common ingredient between the David story and the Jesus and the disciples story, the common ingredient is a a real simple, profound human need, food. In fact, you see Jesus coming back to this over and over in his ministry. Real religion, well, forget that. The religion of Jesus feeds people. It takes care of basic human need and it tests theology by how it interacts with real humanity. Then Jesus said, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And when you're reading through this, I know I'm not the only one that's done this. I've been reading through this for a few 50 years or so, and you come down, you read this story about the disciples eating grain and David eating bread, and then Jesus says, so the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, and you're going, what? I mean, how how does that phrase flow out of this story? And I'm not sure I can put it into words. I worked at it all week. I think I'm beginning to feel it in my gut. When Jesus calls himself the son of man, he's highlighting his role as fully human. What is required of Jesus is required of humanity, all of us. What is allowed to Jesus is allowed to all of us. People often read this story and then they want to go, oh, so see, Jesus was God so he could tell us how to keep the Sabbath. I don't think that's the point Jesus is making. He's saying, David did it, I did it. So all people can do it. What matters most is the treatment of humanity. If we go to one of the other gospels, Jesus in Mark, Jesus says, because the Sabbath was made for people, people were not made for the Sabbath. 
You know, God did not invent Sabbath and then go, wow, I need some, I need some creatures to keep it. You know, the Sabbath was not the symphony that God had written and then he needed an audience. Sabbath was made, it was God's gift to humanity to enrich our lives. To make space for special communion with him, special communion with one another, we who know each other. And then, as we read in several of these commandments, it is to facilitate even the communion with the foreigners, the slaves, and the animals. Often Christianity wants to, Christians will go, well, we are people, we matter, animals, eh, whatever. But the Sabbath commandment says no, that's a false dichotomy that way. Humans and animals are different. But you cannot keep Sabbath and be dismissive of the well-being of, of animals because the commandment frequently links them in there. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus showed us what it means to be fully human and fully Sabbath-keeping. And it doesn't look exactly like the Pharisees. Now, I don't want to be over dismissive of the Pharisees. As I mentioned before, they wrestled with how, how do we bring these things in? But the problem with the Pharisees is that they had forgotten, even though in their formal theology they would have affirmed it, they forgot that if you stacked all of the scripture in the world in one pile, and over here you have an infant this infant is more valuable than all the scripture in the universe. We call ourselves people of the book, and it's a good thing. But it's a dangerous thing. It suggests that the book is the highest thing among us, and it must not be. Jesus did not die for books, not even for the Bible. He died for people. And God's goal is not that through all eternity we will have a book that is revered, but that through all eternity there is a sweet communion between God and his people. The book is a tool to be dispensed with when the job is done. Now I'm really going to go to meddling. If that was not harsh enough. Sometimes you will hear Christians, Adventists, say, you know what? You know what would fix everything is if we could just get back to the Bible and if we took every word in the Bible, that would fix the world. The problem is, they say, we, we're a little too soft. We need to get back to the bracing vigor of taking every word in Scripture as absolutely eternally authoritative. Be careful. Martin Luther and John Calvin, the two most famous founders of Protestantism, people who helped us become people of the book. We celebrate them because they helped create space within the family of God for people who did not salute the Pope in Rome. But we need to be aware what their reading of the Bible and Bible only led them to do. Both of them approved the execution of people who disagreed with them, including burning them alive. That's what their reading of the Bible led them to do. Martin Luther and John Calvin were not meaner people than we are. But they had not yet learned that there's parts of the Bible that must be subordinated to the religion of Jesus. We all, I would assume, are aware of the horrors that are happening in the Middle East right now. 
brought on by the Islamic State or ISIS or whatever you want to call it. I want to read to you a paragraph. This is a quote from one of the theologians who is the, one of the ideologues behind ISIS. We need to understand these people are religious people. They have theologians who provide serious theological uh, guidance for what they do. Listen to what I'm reading here. You will be horrified. But hold your horror because there's that instruction here. Maybe some of you remember that a while back there was a group of people called the Yazidis that were trapped on a mountain in northern Iraq. And the armies from, from ISIS had surrounded them or wanting to, to get a hold of these people. So the theologians were being asked, so when we win and when we capture all these people, what do we do with them? Once we win, what do we do with them? And here's what one of their theologians wrote in one of their major publications. The women and children are, be, are to be divided according to the Sharia law amongst the fighters of the Islamic State who participated in the operations there. Did you hear what I just said? Enslaving the families of the infidels and taking their women as concubines is a firmly established aspect of Sharia law. And if one denies it or mocks it, he would be denying or mocking the verses of the Quran and the narrations of the Prophet and therefore is an apostate from Islam. And if you're an apostate from Islam, you must be killed. So to question the rightness of taking women captured in war and making sex slaves out of them, if you question that, you must be killed. That is an impudence and an affront to God that cannot be tolerated. Now we go, oh, I can't, that's terrible. It, it is terrible. Now reading from the Bible. Numbers 31, and instead of talking about the Yazidis, we're talking about the Midianites. The Israeli army had captured the Midianites, had, had conquered them, and had collected a whole bunch of, they had all, you know, the whole population was now captured. They're asking Moses, what do we do with these people? Here were the instructions. Now, therefore, kill every male among, the, among them and kill all the male children. Kill every woman who has been with a man, but all the women children that have not known a man keep alive for yourselves. If you think about the 200 girls that were captured in Nigeria by Boko Haram. This is not ISIS now, but it's the same philosophy. What they did was approved by these words, taken from Numbers 31, if they saw themselves as the people of God. Now, you and I read this language, you go, no. Absolutely not. And fortunately, Christians for 2,000 years have dismissed this language. We go, yeah, whatever God was doing back there, and some people go, yeah, that God was doing it, and other people go, no, I don't even, I think they misunderstood. Whatever that was back there, we, for 2,000 years, have repudiated it. We don't do that. We're not hoping for some time in the future when we'll be able to get back to doing that. We reject it, even though it is written. And there are other passages. I haven't heard of anybody for 2,000 years proposing that we kill children until. About two years ago in Arkansas, a Republican congressman proposed legislation to allow the implementation of killing children who were rebellious. And the reason was, he said, we would fix America if we could just get back to doing what the Bible says. 
He's crazy. But let's be clear. In Christianity, I can stand and say, that's crazy without being stoned. Because in our religion, there is in fact not just a 2,000-year-old tradition of arguing with authority. There's a, maybe a 4,000-year-old tradition. The heroes in the Old Testament, Abraham and Moses, both argued with God, and Moses got God to change his mind. We have embedded within our religion a tradition of both honoring the word of God, the Bible and every word in it, and then turning around and going, but I don't think so. When God told Moses to get out of the way so God could kill the people, Moses said, over my dead body. And God honored that. And if somebody here proposes <laughs> stoning their children, we'll all get in the way. I don't care what it says. We understand that humans are more valuable than ancient words. The purpose of the words was to give us wisdom and inspiration in following Jesus in his ministry of salvation. Not just salvation in the sense of escaping from damnation. Salvation in the sense of pursuing the wholeness and well-being of God's people, which happens to be all of us. If we keep Sabbath the way God intended us to keep it, Sabbath will probably not be a time when we're jumping on each other because, eh, you wiggled your finger wrong. But Sabbath will become a weekly time when we go back and remind ourselves or allow God to remind us that our obligations extend not just to me and mine, and the foreigners, but to all creation. Let's take the Bible and use it to pursue that mission. And let us embrace that mission and allow it to shape the way we read the book. And if the book interferes with that mission, the book will have to bend.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.